I think it's time to go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Cannabis Chat Live for a Friday afternoon. I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media, and you are? David Rabinovitz, Jimmy Sidekick, every Friday. <laughs> I think we could put a few more things under there, too. Uh, you're the treasurer of MassCan, among other things, right? Yeah, but Jimmy, this, this is the crowning achievement. My Friday afternoons with you. Wow. We're going to have to get a life. Anyway, uh, we've got a really big show planned. It's all about the state of New Jersey. We've got a great lineup. We'll be talking about the newest East Coast adult use legal market that's about to start in New Jersey. And we've got a lineup that includes our friend Rob Mejia from Stockton University. It includes some new friends. It also includes Paul Josephson, I believe, from... Uh, from, um, isn't he, uh, what's the name of it? Dwayne Morris, isn't it? It is. I believe so. All right. But most importantly, we have a lead story, something breaking, if you will, uh, something hot off the presses. And we have just the guy to talk to about this because Morgan Fox, the communications director of the NCIA, National Cannabis Industry Association, joins us live. How are you, Morgan, today? I'm doing great, Jimmy. Uh, a lot better than I was doing a week ago. And isn't that the flavor of Washington, D.C. this week? Uh, the general consensus seems to be like the grown-ups are in charge now. <laughs> well, Dr. Fauci made that really clear yesterday. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But there was a there's actually a piece of news, Morgan, that we're going to jump right on here, that the first piece of cannabis legislation has been drafted. That doesn't mean that it's gone to the floor. It doesn't mean it's gone to a vote. Doesn't mean that it's been a law yet, but it's been drafted by Representative uh, Greg Stubbe, I believe from Florida. Can you tell us a little bit about what you know about this draft of this legislation? Well, uh, it's really a rescheduling uh, legislation. So it's not necessarily something that NCIA or most advocates are gonna support. Um, descheduling is really where uh, most of Congress and where all of advocates are focused right now, uh, simply rescheduling cannabis doesn't necessarily take care of a lot of the, uh, the conflict between uh, state and federal law, uh, as well as a ton of the other issues that are problematic with uh, the placement of cannabis as an illegal drug, uh, period. So, you know, it's great to see that this is being introduced immediately and it is sort of in line with uh, what the Biden administration has been pushing for, but we're pushing for something much stronger. Well, we know that. And in speaking of President Biden, I think that may be the first time I've said that. Uh, he is he wrote a whole bunch of executive orders and and being a cannabis advocate, I was really hoping that it was like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to deschedule cannabis right now with an executive order. It didn't happen. So in a lot of ways, I was a little disappointed, but also I also am a realist of sorts. So yeah, I recognize it's not the highest priority, given the fact that we continue to battle this horrific pandemic. Um, was there any disappointment among the industry as far as not being part of those first executive orders he put out there? Not particularly. I mean, uh, in terms of support for cannabis policy, it's very broad, but not very deep. So uh, this is obviously not going to be a priority issue for a lot of people, despite the fact that it does have uh, intersections with uh, a lot of the really high priority issues in the Biden administration in terms of criminal justice. But uh, we're steadily moving towards having a much greater priority standing when it comes to this particular piece of, uh, or not this particular piece of legislation, but cannabis legislation uh, overall. And having uh, Vice President uh, Harris be the person that is now the tiebreaker in the Senate as the uh, primary Senate sponsor of the MORE Act, I think is really going to help to raise that priority of the issue. But clearly there are things that the administration needs to deal with first and foremost. Uh, you know, not to say that cannabis policy reform is not an important issue, but there are a lot of things that Americans care about a lot more right now. Uh, and there are a lot of tie-ins to that. So we're looking to capitalize on the uh, intersectionality of cannabis issues with a lot of the other issues that people care about, such as healthcare reform and uh, criminal justice reform in the coming months. David? I, I was just going to add a comment, Jimmy, but it's like two subway stops back now. 
I don't know that the president actually has the authority to deschedule. I believe that pen rests exclusively with the attorney general, and I don't think we have an attorney general right now. Well, the uh, uh, the president can reschedule, but the president cannot deschedule. And so this is uh, definitely a big issue. Like we would like the administration to do certain things, uh, particularly reinstating the coal memo and perhaps a version of the coal memo that has a little bit more teeth and that is more in line with what state laws have put in place. Uh, but we absolutely do not want a push for rescheduling because that would throw every single existing cannabis program into chaos. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Uh, even though, even uh, moving the, the needle a little bit to schedule three would still help the industry, but I understand the industry wants a home run here or at least a double uh, to see if they can deschedule it and perhaps open up a few more things too. I, I, I can get that. I get that. Do you, but again, the biggest question, Morgan, is, you know, can you look into your crystal ball and actually think when they may actually get to talking about this, maybe reintroducing the MORE Act? Well, I think that we're going to see a reintroduction of the MORE Act, uh, hopefully with some changes that will eliminate some of the problematic things that were uh, added to it at the last minute, right before it was passed in the last session, uh, within the next couple of months. Uh, clearly, there are other issues that Congress has to work on, but uh, we are pushing night and day to make sure that they don't forget about us and that they uh, allow for stakeholders uh, from across the board to be able to weigh in on uh, this legislation and make sure that some of the problematic things that were thrown into the MORE Act as it was passed by Congress last year are removed because some of those things uh, really fly in the face of the real uh, purpose of the MORE Act. Uh, particularly the uh, uh, allowance that it, it doesn't necessarily require, but it allows federal regulators to ban people that uh, have been convicted of felonies from participating in the cannabis industry, uh, at least in terms of federal licensing. And that is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do with this sort of legislation. Right. David? Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to just uh, stay calm and quiet over here for a few moments. Okay. All right. That's fine. I want to get um, so the, the, the point, Jimmy. So to, to, to reschedule marijuana to schedule three, as you and I were talking about before the show started, is absolutely huge. It is a phenomenal win for the industry, right? But marijuana isn't just a, a commercial industry issue. It's also a social issue. Rescheduling it to schedule three does nothing for criminal justice. And it, well, maybe a little bit. But it really doesn't do a lot, and it does not do a lot on the social side because it's still a controlled substance. All it means is 280E taxation goes away because that only applies to Schedule One and Schedule Two. So, the, yeah, it is I mean, I'd like to jump in there that uh, rescheduling even to Schedule Three is not a win for the industry, and it's not a win for uh, social justice advocates either because it does not completely remove the, uh, the criminal justice aspects in, under federal law, but it also would require every single state to completely rework their, uh, their legal cannabis systems, be they medical or uh, adult use. And it would cause complete chaos. There you go, David. So let it go, pal, let it go. Let those in charge do their job. Will you please, we, at this point, you know, we've waited a long time, I think, we can wait for the right time and, and let the process work itself out. And more importantly, let's get vaccinations out to as many people as possible over the next four months, because that's really what has to be the focus of the federal government at this point, at least in my opinion. Um, Morgan, how does the industry react to the attorney general pick for, from Biden, uh, Merrick Garland? Well, Merrick Garland's opinions on cannabis are somewhat of an unknown. Uh, that's why NCIA's government relations team is working with our allies in the Senate to pose uh, some questions regarding that during the confirmation process so that we can get a little bit more clarity on exactly where he stands. Uh, so far from what we've seen, we are pretty hopeful because he has said that he uh, really does look at uh, the research, which is a lot more than recent uh, attorney generals have had to say about it. And, uh, you know, at the very least, we can expect uh, the same pattern of non-interference. Uh, we would really like to see a, an official reinstatement of the Cole memo uh, in preparation for Congress acting. Uh, 
And we'd also like to see several other executive actions uh, happen, uh, not just in the Department of Justice, but in terms of like the VA, uh, in terms of uh, forcing the DEA to start accepting research uh, applications, uh, in terms of uh, changing immigration policy so that uh, a simple cannabis conviction is no longer grounds for deportation. And so that people that are not United States residents can freely travel within the United States uh, to do business with the, the cannabis industry. Uh, these are all very simple things that the administration can do and that we're hoping to see over the, uh, the next six months to a year. What has to happen for them to uh, reinstate that Cole memo? Is that a Department of Justice thing or is it a presidential executive decision? Uh, that can happen uh, either uh, unilaterally within the Department of Justice or uh, from the top down from the administration. There you go. So again, it's an administrative thing uh, and it could happen rather quickly and at least it would send a signal. Um, so looking at the agenda for the lobbyists, the NCIA group that's down there working hard on the, what is the first step to towards legalization because every time we put out something that says, well, will we be legalized in 2021? You know, you get a ton of people looking at it. They're all interested, but nobody has come right out and said, here's our plan. Is there, there's gotta be some, some kind of strategy here. Well, the Safe Banking Act is the low hanging fruit. Uh, it's been passed three times by the house already in some form or another, both as standalone legislation, as well as add-ons to coronavirus relief. So we're pushing for it to be included in the next coronavirus relief package. But uh, the fact that it, you know, even if it doesn't get included in that package, uh, now that Democrats have control of uh, the Senate, we have the ability to have hearings on it. And we have much more receptive lawmakers that are in charge of the, uh, uh, the hearing schedule and the voting schedule in the Senate. So uh, and we've always had bipartisan support on this, uh, you know, pretty broad bipartisan support, uh, to be honest. But we were unable to get hearings because of interference, uh, because of uh, Speaker McConnell. And now that McConnell is no longer the speaker, we have uh, a lot of opportunities to really move incremental uh, legislation forward very quickly. Uh, Safe Banking Act being uh, the first one, uh, access for veterans uh, through the VA system being another, uh, removing barriers to research, uh, changing uh, things uh, with revol uh with regards to cannabis uh, and uh, immigration, uh, if the administration does not want to move on those, uh, the Senate can move on those very quickly. And that's all legislation that is already in play. So, uh, you know, we're very hopeful that a lot of this incremental legislation will be able to move very quickly now that uh, the major barriers to hearings and votes are out of the way. Absolutely. David, you got anything? You're going to just sit there. Uh, I'm going to, Jimmy, you're, you're on a great roll. I don't want to interrupt you. I mean, I'm trying I, to train you to have questions ready to go. So if I'm asking a question, then you ask a question. It's okay. We'll keep I working on it. You got to be I have plenty more. It's important for me to mess up anything with him. Okay. That's oh, fair give enough. Me the tough ones. What's that? Give me the tough ones. Right. Well, I want to talk to, about some of the other um, cabinet posts. That, well, I, I got, great. I'll throw a tough one out. So there you go. I, I knew it would just take a matter of time. Sessions rescinding the Cole memo actually had any impact in any of the uh, uh, the local U.S. attorneys? Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, we didn't see any anything noticeable. Um, and I think that that's largely because uh, U.S. attorneys that actually were on the ground in legal states saw the benefit of regulating cannabis as opposed to having uh, cannabis com uh, completely controlled by the unregulated market. And right. uh, so we didn't see a, a whole lot of crackdowns. I mean, a lot of people were really scared when Jeff Sessions initially rescinded the Cole memo, but we didn't see a whole lot of difference in terms of actual practice from U.S. attorneys and federal prosecutors uh, because of just the facts and the wisdom of not interfering with these uh, these state programs. So we assume that they are going to uh, continue, but it's always better to have it in writing, even if it's not a law, which, you know, the Cole Memo was not law, it was just federal guidance. It's nice to have that in writing so that we can fall back on that. And it's also, it, it sends a strong signal just as the, uh, the initial Cole and Ogden memos did uh, back in 2009 and uh, 2013 uh, that allowed uh, businesses and individuals to start 
really exploring the possibilities of what they could do within a legal cannabis space uh, with that assurance from the Department of Justice that they were not going to get targeted and they weren't going to have their businesses kicked in by uh, like SWAT teams. Right. Yep. Yeah. I, 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 at the time, I didn't think it was going to have any impact right? for the for the reason that even though they're U.S. attorneys, they still have an eye toward the political wins. And I, I can't see up here in Massachusetts, Andrew Lelling want to go after all the marijuana establishments. All he would do is upset everybody in the Commonwealth. And well, even in places where the U.S. attorneys are, are very much against any sort of cannabis policy reform, and you can look at the uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of West Virginia as a perfect example, uh, people that are very, very against legalization, uh, they still have to see that regulated cannabis systems are far superior and better in terms of uh, criminal justice and health outcomes for everybody involved in their states and in their uh, uh, municipal uh, uh, zones of control than prohibition. I mean, the facts are there and the facts are on our side. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there wasn't really too much of a huge uh, practical impact in terms of rescinding the Cole memo, but it's still better to have it on paper. Even if it's not a law, it's still policy on paper and it will uh, prevent uh, potential like Yahoo prosecutors from uh, like uh, extending beyond the bounds of their mandate and deciding to make an example of uh, perfectly legal and lawful uh, businesses that they just don't like. Yeah, you know, I, we I, saw I, a little I, bit I, of that uh, during the bar uh, control of the, uh, the Department of Justice, where, you know, despite the fact that federal prosecutors were not interested at all in going after cannabis businesses, uh, then Attorney General Barr was specifically directing them to go after uh, uh, larger cannabis businesses for antitrust violations, uh, even though all of his prosecutors and all the evidence was suggesting there's absolutely nothing there. So when we have that on paper and in writing, uh, even though it's not a law, it's still better than nothing. Right. It's, it's a nice form of symbolism. I've got, exactly. I got a question, Morgan. So you guys are based in Washington, D.C. Obviously, a national organization makes sense. Um, but I also know you have state chapters, as does normal, as does the Marijuana Policy Project. Who has the more established uh, lobbyist group or impact around the country? Or is it kind of equally divided and you all are working towards the same goal? Well, uh, NCIA's offices are actually based in Denver, but we do have a, a D.C. office. And also, we don't have state chapters, but we do have uh, arrangements with uh, state organizations that are similar to our own so that we can provide them resources and they can provide us information about the nitty gritty stuff that's going on on the ground there to help us better inform our efforts on the, uh, the national scale, as well as to uh, help let people know about uh, the benefits of becoming NCIA members if you're getting into the industry there. Um, I get you. Hey, to, uh, go to, ahead. To, to your question, um, you know, I, I think that uh, there, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, differences in terms of how states approach uh, a lot of these legally uh, legalization issues. Um, we try to be as involved with them as possible, and uh, more so, we try to involve uh, or empower our members to be involved with them directly, so that they don't have you know top down control. We give them the tools that they need to be able to create the best possible state regulatory systems and then feed us information so that we can use that to help develop the best possible regulatory systems at the federal level. There you go. Hey, um, just so you know, I, I knew it was Denver, by the way, I, because I was on the podcast with Bethany and I think they're releasing it this week. So, you know, that's going to be must listen to podcast. You know what I'm saying? Well, you won't learn anything about me that you don't already know, Morgan, just for the record, okay? Just for the record. But I think you'll find it entertaining. Um, you always got stuff to say. That's yes, what we're right, that's right. yes, I do. That, that's the point of being a talk show host. Um, I do want to ask you about the state of New Jersey and how important the state of New Jersey and subsequently the state of New York can be to the whole effort because we know that Governor Cuomo has it in his budget and there's a few things that are still being debated. New Jersey, of course, is trying to finish it finally and get it rolling. Um, how important is building more of an East Coast presence for mm -hmm. legal states? Well, I mean, I think that it's absolutely important uh, because of both the, uh, the cultural and the population aspects involved. Uh, and 
there are uh, a lot of, uh, you know, various nuances involved in there. I mean, uh, New Jersey has uh, been uh, facing delay after delay after delay based on uh, intricacies in the policies that they're going to uh, propose or that they're going to enact. And, you know, I honestly, I think that it's good that these issues get hashed out. Uh, but if they take too long doing so, uh, they're going to get surpassed by other states. Uh, you know, New York is waiting the wings. New York might take a while to figure out the details there. And to tell you the truth, uh, you know, NCIA has a lot of problems with uh, the way that uh, New York is proposing uh, to legalize cannabis, uh, particularly with the ban of home grow, which is uh, completely unjust and uh, really problematic. Um, also, the, uh, the relatively high taxation level, uh, you know, until we figure out uh, how to get rid of 280E, whether it be through, uh, you know, federal legalization or whether it is through very specific taxation legislation, uh, you know, when you start to overtax these businesses, even if uh, the tax sources are righteous and just, uh, justice oriented, uh, the backlash of that is such that it empowers the illicit market which pays no taxes. And that means less money going towards uh, restorative justice efforts. So, uh, you know, I think that it's something that definitely is going to need to get worked out and something that will be worked out, hopefully within the next couple of months. Uh, but, you know, New Jersey was really the linchpin and set off a domino effect because nobody wants to get left behind in this market. And so now we're seeing states that had already been considering legalization measures, such as Connecticut and Delaware and New York and Pennsylvania and Maryland and Rhode Island, uh, have now been put into overdrive. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of overdrive, it's that time of day, uh, Friday afternoon at 420. It's when we take our first break. Uh, so I want to thank Morgan Fox for joining us. And I also appreciate your commitment to every third Friday. And more importantly, you know how to read a calendar. We do not. So I give you credit. <laughs> you were ready to go last week. And I said, oh, I completely forgot New Year's Day was actually a Friday. So uh, that tell, just tells you how crazy we are here. But Morgan, uh, no I so appreciate you uh, committing and helping us out here and, and spreading the word and good luck. Lord knows you've got a lot on your plate down there. Uh, just stay healthy and uh, hopefully let's move that needle a little, very uh, as far as you can go in 2021. All right. Well, we're going to have a lot of stuff to talk about next month, I think. All right. That well, sounds like a deal. Welcome. We'll see you on the third third Friday in February. And if I had my calendar, I would tell you exactly what that is, but I'll get you back. You know that. The 19th, Jimmy. Thank you. The 19th, Morgan. I, that's why David, now I know why David's here. He knows how to read a calendar. <laughs> All right. Morgan Fox, thank you so much for joining us. And it is 420. And that is the time when we take our first break. And we celebrate the fact that the Waldos, those high school kids from San Rafael, California, always used to meet at the Louis Pasteur statue across the street from their high school back in the early 70s. Since then, the industry has embraced the 20 past four numbers and also the date on the calendar, April 20th, as kind of a celebration for cannabis. I, growing up in the 70s, used to listen to Jonathan Edwards. He wrote a song called Shanty, and we share that with you every Friday at 420 on the back end. We'll have our New Jersey contingent in the room, and we'll continue with more of Cannabis Chat live after this. Pro Cannabis Media Programming is available live and on demand on our Facebook page at Pro Canna Media, on Instagram at Pro Cannabis Media, on LinkedIn also at Pro Cannabis Media, on YouTube and YouTube Live on Pro Cannabis Media, Twitter at Pro Canna Media, and on twitch.tv backslash Pro Cannabis Media. So like, share, and subscribe to all of our content, newsletters, and shows live or on demand. We are Pro Cannabis Media.